Welcome to Dodgers Daily. I'm Casey Porter on a Friday morning, joined by Austin Brubaker, not Coach Holt. Coach Holt is on vacation with his brothers, and so he's going to have a couple of Fridays off. I am joined by Austin Brubaker, as I was on Monday, and then the Wednesday Dodgers Dog Show. We're so glad that you decided to tune in. So, hey, Austin, man, it was an exciting game last night. I talk all the time. I love pitchers' duels. I wouldn't want 162 of them, but it's like fourth down and goal for like three, four hours in a row, isn't it? Yeah, no, it was a really exciting game yesterday. You got to see some of that playoff energy. You got to see just the Dodgers pitching staff and defense really be able to play really an effective game, Uh, a different type of game than what we normally see from the Dodgers. Normally we see this offense pop, but it's really good to see the Dodgers be able to grind out and pull out a win against a really tough pitch pitcher on Milwaukee's side and when their offense just doesn't have it completely together uh being able to pull out the win yesterday was really uh really special yeah that pitcher you're talking about for Milwaukee is a guy that the Dodgers you hear you know when you hear hey who do the Dodgers want to pick up in a trade scenario you hear the name Corbin Burns quite a bit so he put on a pretty good show didn't he yeah, he did. Yeah, and he just showed just how dominant he can be from the Milwaukee side. Uh, he's somebody that we've talked about quite a while. I think that has to do with <clears throat> him being in a little bit of a smaller market, mm-hmm. knowing he's coming up on free agency, so there might be a little bit of intrigue right there. Milwaukee's still a good ball club. They're still fighting for a playoff spot. He's going to be a big part of the reason why they could potentially make the playoffs, and he's starting to find his groove into the season two. Too. And you saw that last night. He was just dominant against a really good Dodgers lineup. Yep. You, the the two names in a package you hear together are Corbin Burns and Willie Adamas quite a bit. The shortstop, obviously, for Milwaukee. But, hey, how about Austin Barnes? First home run of the year. And I'll be darned if it wasn't the game winner. Yeah, no, sometimes the heroes of the game can come from unexpected places. We've talked a lot about Austin Barnes this season. Everybody knows the season has not gone the way that he's wanted, that the Dodgers have wanted. And But there are still certain times in the season where even if everything seems to be going wrong, you can go ahead and step up and make a big moment for yourself. Perhaps this could be a moment that changes his season around, too. We saw him get the big hit, get the home run that put the Dodgers over the top in this game, and they needed somebody to step up and come through. It's just really good to see Austin Barnes be able to do that. So the Dodgers moved to 74-46. and 46. I did a little bit of math. Hey, they're right at 99 to 100 wins. That's what they're on pace for. Isn't that amazing? Oh, it's absolutely incredible, especially when we were talking about them maybe struggling a bit, maybe being five, ten games over 500 just about a month or so ago. Yeah. To be able yeah. to go on the stretch, to be able to go on this run and continue to show that they can grind out 95 to 100 wins in the season. Obviously, they have to continue with a lot, some of this pace, they have to continue winning. Uh, it's still incredible to see this organization continue to know how to win in the regular season. No doubt. Ten and a half over the Giants, then 13 and a half over the D-backs, 17 over the Padres. That, I, every time I say that and I start every show with those numbers, it just that just floors me. Of course, the Dodgers, 15 and one this month, they've won 11 in a row. Yeah, no, just absolutely incredible. They are on a roll right now. This is the best baseball of the season that they've played. They're finding their groove. They're showing some of the recipes that they can win games. They're finding different ways to win. It's not just their offense is always dominant, as you saw last night. They were able to grind out wins, too, with their pitching staff. They're able to go nine scoreless innings, be able to get some scoreless innings from their pitching staff, even when their offense doesn't succeed, which is what we've kind of talked about, finding different ways to win. This is one of the different ways they've been able to find ways to win. If I would have asked you, if I made this scenario up on, say, uh, the last day of July, said, hey, okay, here in about, about two, three weeks, Okay, Austin Barnes and Lance Lynn are going to team up together for a one to nothing win for the Dodgers to sweep the Milwaukee Brewers, to put them ten and a half games over the Giants, 
and uh, on pace to win almost 100 games. If I would have thrown that scenario out at you at, at the last day of July or before that, you would have laughed at me in the face. Yeah, I would have said you're dreaming about that. Yeah. <laughs> that is absolutely crazy. Okay, so let's get into the meat and potatoes of last night. It's obvious. You've mentioned this, Austin. You said this the other day about it. As a matter of fact, it was like your very first comment about this guy. Lance Lynn, he has a dog mentality. When I say dog, I mean D-A-W-G like our show. Hey, he has that competitive, let's go, give me the ball, let me have seven innings, let me throw at least 100 pitches, let me go. And the competitive environment and culture of the Dodgers and, and you know, the just the awesomeness of – of uh, when you look around, you see Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts, and just just the great environment that's obviously brought out the dog in him. Yeah, and I think you, there's one word that you said in there that's incredibly important for Lance Lynn, and I think one of the reasons why he's having success, and that's culture. Mm-hmm. There's something different about this Dodgers culture. There's something different about this Dodgers team. They're having a lot of fun. They have a competitive, gritty environment, gritty team that wants to go to the ballpark every day, that wants to win. And I think that's something that Lance Lynn, there's been rumors about the the culture for Chicago maybe not being quite as good. Um, We're seeing when you put a good culture together, when you put that combined with some of the talent that the Dodgers have, what that can do to help bring out the best in their players. And with Lance Lynn, we've known about the success that he's had in the past for quite a while. His season Mm -hmm. a couple of years ago is Cy Young level starter Mm -hmm. material. He has that ability in there. He has the ability to go deep into games, which is what he's doing for the Dodgers. And last night, I think you're seeing all of these things kind of come together. He's able to pitch for length. He's pitching in a team that has a good culture that's able to help support him. Even though last night offensively, the the offense wasn't quite there, he was still able to pitch through. He got through a a tough environment in the seventh inning where they had runners on and they were able to keep it scoreless through that game Mm -hmm. i think you're seeing him pitch through some of this adversity and i think he has a little bit of a better understanding a little bit of a better attitude because he's surrounded by good players because he's surrounded by a good culture i think that's part of the reason why we're seeing lance lynn kind of turn his season around yeah that makes you that brings out your competitive juices and your competitive vibes then it also makes you feel like hey i can't let these dudes down man these guys are winners i've got to be like them you know i've got to perform the same way they have. Okay, so seven innings scoreless, three strikeouts, one walk, just four hits. So it was a great performance. We'll get into some of the meat and the pota- uh, the meat and potatoes of it here in a minute. Okay, so since becoming a Dodger, 144 ERA, average against 188, whip 088, 25 strikeouts, five walks. That that's that's pretty amazing. Five to one strikeout to walk ratio playoff tracker okay top three pitchers i still say this we said this on dodgers dogs i think it would be Urias, kershaw and right now i think your your next pitcher in line would be lance lynn i I, i'm still on that right now i think those are my top three okay lance lynn six pitches last night the thing about him that was really cool he had different layers of secondary pitches. He had what I, I call the heavy breakers, you know, the curveball and the slider that had the big movements to them. And then he also had the smaller shapes. So his, his two secondary pitches he threw the most were his heavy breakers, his curveball and his slider. Then the next two secondary pitch, and he threw those almost identical. He threw his curveball 12%. He threw his slider 11%. Then the next layer of secondaries he had – were his smaller shape pitch, which would be uh, his cutter and uh, uh, his cutter and uh, his sinker. So you had a little bit of a left turn to the the cutter, the right turn to the sinker. So it was cool how he layered those. And then when you look at his cutter and his sinker, he threw his cutter nine percent and his sinker one percent. And within both of those layers, his curveball was a good strike pitch. His cutter was a good strike pitch. So he had two different layers of secondaries. Within each layer, he had at least one of those that was a good strike pitch for him. Yeah, no, I think he had a good feel. And you're starting to see what having experience and being able to have a lot of uh, MLB seasons underneath your belt and having a just having that ability to know how to pitch, to have different pitches in your arsenal. 
and just trusting the Dodgers to be able to call for the right pitch mix uh, is really important. I think I got it right last night. The pitch mix, I'm telling you, when you when you break down exactly what pitches he threw, when the percentages he threw them, the way that he was executing the pitches, it's just absolutely phenomenal the amount of research that went into that, the execution to actually get that called properly, and then you know the final end of it, the execution of Lance Lynn to actually go out and do it. That I mean, if you just really break it down and look at what actually happened with him last night, one of the most impressive performances from hey you know the 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 scouting room the game plan room all the way out to the mound that was I, I'm, I'm just telling you I'm totally impressed with the way that worked last night okay Caleb Ferguson of course whenever your, your starters give you seven innings that a lot you know we, we've had this conversation many times should Evan Phillips be the closer should he have that the highest leverage innings hey that question goes away whenever your starter gives you seven innings because that allows you to Put Evan Phillips pretty much in the closer role because you only need one guy to one guy to come in and throw one inning. Yeah, no, and he was able to step up. He was able to continue with the success that Lance Lynn was having, and that's sometimes important when you get a incredible outing from your starting pitcher. You want that bullpen, that first guy to come up and just continue to roll with. And Ferguson provided that he was able to shut down the Milwaukee lineup in his one inning of work yesterday, which was incredibly important after seven scoreless innings. Yeah, no doubt. Okay, so Caleb Ferguson, I, I wanted to ask you this because you're, you're big into, you know, kind of diving behind the curtains. Okay, Caleb Ferguson, his ERA on the year, 238, which is good. But his whip is 138. His average against is 250, which that's not great, okay? So has the results, out, you know, and a lot of, you know, Dodgers fans still kind of get nervous when he comes in. I, I just kind of get that vibe. So have his results actually outperformed how well he's pitched this year? Is there a little is that a little bit off, do you think? I don't think it's completely off, although I'm not incredibly worried about that. So there's a couple of additional statistics that you can look at as far as looking to see if the results are uh, perhaps too good from what is expected to have happened. And so when which could predict at, the future. Yes, which is entirely about predicting the future. Yes. There's different statistics as far as results base and predictions base as far as predicting the future, how you should have done expected uh, versus uh, some of the other statistics which are based on what you actually did, which the results and what you actually did are important um, for the past. Uh, the prediction ones might be important for predicting the future. And if we look at Ferguson, some of the other expected numbers that he's had, he has ERA, as you said, 2.78. Uh, expected ERA is 3.44. Yeah. Not far off, of, not far away from that. You look yeah. at something like FIP, his FIP is 3.28. Expected FIP 3.87 all kind of around the same area so there might be a little bit of over over performance uh from caleb ferguson but i don't think it's too incredibly far off from who he is and what he's been able to produce that's why i love having you on this show that makes me feel a lot better so good stuff there austin evan phillips his 18th save and like i said whenever you have a seven inning starter you only need one bridge guy you get it to evan phillips for the last three outs of the game and when the last three outs of the game also are the three biggest outs as far as your relievers have to get that makes it pretty easy as far as dave roberts to be able to map evan phillips Okay, it feels like the, the Dodgers have done their best to try to move him to closer if they're given them the situations to do that. Okay, uh, so 254 ERA for Phillips. Whip, 083. Average against 171. 52 Ks, 11 walks, 46 innings. So, hey, man, this guy, he's been good. I think, you know, you talk about the fifth, the expected ERA. That all, I, I haven't looked at all that, but – but the the results have been great, and I and I I mean you could predict that they're going to continue to be great. Yeah, and all the underlying metrics continue to support that Evan Phillips is a great pitcher, and you've seen this not just over 
a short sample size. You've seen this over the course of a long sample size too. He's become one of, if not the most reliable arm out of the bullpen, somebody that they can rely on to finish out the game. He's going to be needed as we continue to go down the stretch. He has the ability to strike batters out while also not giving up those walks, uh, which is really important uh, as even just for the fans sake, uh, as you're watching towards the end of the game. Uh, makes it a little bit easier to watch the finish when you can expect him to get some guys out without putting a ton of runners on. That whip that you talked about, really critical too. Uh, just be- He's just become incredibly reliable, somebody that you can almost expect to get the save opportunity done every single time. Okay, so you talk about all the time, Austin, whenever you break down data and analysis – you know, hey, a lot of this new – now, and, and the new data that, that people use, like expected ERA, like fielding in, independent percentage, what it's actually meant to do is not not just rely on past performance, but it's meant to predict the future, which is really cool. You know, it's also, it's also a situation to where you got to be a little bit careful in certain situations, you know, because a guy like Cabe Ferguson is just a dog, so he works himself out of jams. So you can't take that element away from it either. Having said that, I say that to say this. Okay, you say this all the time, Austin. You're great about balancing these two two things together. It's not about what you've done in the past. It's about what you can do in the future. So if Austin Barnes can just hold his weight just a little bit offensively, obviously he did that last night. That would be a game changer for this team. Yeah, no, that would just add in a little bit of an additional element. You'd be able to give Will Smith some time mm-hmm. off, give him a little bit of rest from catcher just to get him ready for the postseason. Having just that additional backup catcher, being able to produce a little bit offensively, be able to get a little bit of a better feel for that. I'm sure that's been wearing on him, his inability to hit. Sure. I'm sure that's affected him behind the plate, too. If he starts feeling good offensively, you can start – feeling some of his game back and maybe that can affect some of his ability to call pitches, his ability to frame pitches, his overall catching defensive ability as well. Even if he starts getting a little bit of that element back, uh, that's just going to add another element of depth to this Dodgers team. I know we've talked a little bit about his struggles throughout the course of the season, but just adding this element back, being able to get him to be a little bit of productive, just gonna is, is just gonna add depth and just gonna be good for the ball club because we know this team really loves what Austin Barnes brings to the team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's gonna be on the postseason roster. I think there's a hundred percent chance of that. You know, we we've had the discussions and I think they're fun and I think there's a lot, you know, hey, nothing that's been commented on or said has been inaccurate in any different way. But I think there's probably a hundred percent chance that he's gonna make the postseason roster. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think they were if they were going to make the change, they would yeah. have made it a couple of weeks ago just to yeah. give whoever they would have called up some runtime. But I think they enjoy and like what the leadership that he brings. And I think they still believe that he has the ability to potentially turn it around, which he just has to be hot for this team as they get into the playoffs. If they can get him a little bit hot or at least give him closer to the Austin Barnes that he's been in the past, Mm -hmm. I think everything will have been worth it. Here's the thing, okay, where he becomes more than depth. Okay, he's the personal pitcher for Clayton Kershaw, right? Mm -hmm. And then he caught for Lance Lynn last night, who went seven innings scoreless. All right, so, man, he might be the personal catcher for Lance Lynn now too, right? Which I just said about five minutes ago that two of my first three starters would be Clayton Kershaw and Lance Lynn. Yeah. So, out of a, you know their first three games, he stands to catch two of them right now. Yeah, no, if he if he feels the most comfortable and the Dodgers feel most comfortable with him catching for both of them, I mean, you could see him realistically to help with the pitching aspect be in the lineup for some playoff games. It's not just going to be he's going to be sitting off on the bench in case something happens to Will Smith. He's going to he very well could be there just because of his relationship and his ability to help with the pitching side with both of those guys who are going to be incredibly needed for the postseason. That's a really good point. He could very well see himself find a role for the playoffs once again. Yeah, because, 
if the Dodgers front office feel like they already have enough offense, you know, hey, we can hide a guy like an Austin Barnes, even if he doesn't give us a whole lot of offense tomorrow night. If he makes Lance Lynn feel comfortable enough to go seven innings scoreless, that's a good trade off for them. If that's what Clayton Kershaw wants, that's what Clayton Kershaw is going to get. He's obviously earned that. Okay, you're you're repping the the Great Lakes Loons gear. And hey, were you there last night at the Loons game? Yes, uh, yes, I was at the game in Lansing last night, and it was a uh, it was a fun and exciting game. Tell us all about it. I got to hear all about it. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I get there. I normally when I get to these games, I like to get there kind of right when the gates open. I like to get my money's worth and be able to see. And it was funny. So before the game, I actually went down there. Guys were still taking batting practice, and so I went down, kind of just watch towards the end of it they were kind of wrapping up and kind of funny because uh guys were kind of walking off and i was sitting kind of over right by the loons dugout Mm -hmm. and uh choi comes up and he's like i smell something and i'm thinking to myself what what are you talking about choi and i look to my it's been raining all day there's a giant puddle right next to me in the seats and so i'm like oh man is he talking about that that's why i asked him like what are you talking about and he's like yeah i smell something I smell wind tonight. Oh, that's and great. What's What's funny about that is moons have been a little on as you look at the overall stretch of the season. They kind of been kind of on a little bit of a lower end when they've been struggling. They've had some really good competition the past couple of nights. They've lost some really tough games. But to see kind of the energy, to see some of the smiles that they still have even through this just speaks to the culture that they have. And so then you get into the actual game last night, and I've really liked this week the approach that they've had offensively. They've been able to work counts. They've been able to draw a bunch of walks. Um, They still haven't had that big, powerful swing quite yet. I know Mm -hmm. Bubba had a home run on Wednesday, but they're still being able to do that. They're still being able to grind out hits, score runs because they're getting offensive production from everybody. And then you talk about the pitching last night. I got to be my first chance to be able to see Peter Hubeck pitch. And I know his first two outings didn't go quite as well as he would have liked. Last night, he pitched really well. I uh, was able to kind of mix around keep the Lansing hitters off balance. I know he had the one home run, but he showed a lot of promise in the, that outing. His second run was given up by a wild pitch. And I mm-hmm. think that's something that you saw with actually two of Lansing's runs came from a couple of wild pitches that moved runners over. They were able to hit them in, uh, but you go up and down the pitchers that they had. Hugh Beck was really solid. Uh, Christian Suarez, when he's able to keep it in the strike zone, zone, he is incredibly dominant. And yet last night he showed, I know he's been kind of put into kind of a relief role where he Mm -hmm. comes in in case something happens to some of the starters. Perhaps they're not able to provide as much length. He was actually able to go in there in a clean inning and he showed just how dominant he can be. Ronaldo DePaulo has been extremely reliable extremely no solid throughout the entire season uh there was audible gaps by how good and how electric carlos de los santos yeah. stuff is his velocity i mean he was hitting 98 99 and it's not one of those lansing radar gun 98 yeah. 99s right. it's, legit. it's legit it's legit stuff uh and then you got to see ronan cop come in in relief and i think this is something that you're probably going to see if he stays with great lakes uh in the postseason for the for uh great lakes seeing him be able to come out out of the pen uh he got the big double play in the eighth inning got incredibly mm-hmm. weak contact on that made a big strikeout to close it and then you got to see benoni robles who comes in and almost every single time he gets a save opportunity he makes the save so yep. overall I'm very happy with that. I'm even though they lo- dropped the first two games, I'm really happy with the offensive approach that they've been able to take. They've been more patient. They've been able to get base hits. Last night you saw Alex Freeland hit not just a couple of cheap base hits, but a couple of line drive base mm-hmm. hits too. Just yeah. a really good environment that you're seeing with Great Lakes. So Robles, eleventh save of twenty twenty three. Three scoreless outings in a row. Seven of his last eight have been scoreless. He has 24 strikeouts since the beginning of July. 
That covers 11.1 innings. Carlos De Los Santos obviously has the big fastball, 98-99. Ronan Kopp, not on a pitch innings limit, not at all, okay? And I don't think that the uh, – the 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 relief thing is permanent, you know. So yeah. I don't think either one of those are a fact. I think it's just adding versatility to his game right now. Check this out: average against for Ronan Cop by month: April two twenty six, May two hundred, June one twenty five, July two twenty, August one thirty six. K's per inning pitched. Okay, so how many strikeouts does he have based on how many innings pitched he's thrown? April twenty six strikeouts, fourteen point two innings. May. 16 strikeouts, 13.1 innings. June, 19 strikeouts, 14.1 innings. August, 12 strikeouts, 7.2 innings. Every single month this year, substantially, he's had more strikeouts than he has had innings pitched. Now, obviously, you know, hey, just like every other pitcher in the minor leagues, the control could be better, but the explosive stuff obviously is there. Christian Suarez, the big back foot breaking ball. And then Peter Hubeck, he's always had that big, you know, kind of a right-handed curveball version of Clayton Kershaw's big looping curveball. That's always been his number one secondary pitch. He's been working on smaller shapes to tunnel off his fastball a little bit better and to make his secondary pitch he can control a bit better. He threw that slider quite a bit last night. Yes, he did. Yeah, and it was really effective. You got to see uh, just just his ability to be able to pitch and get some of these hitters out, which I know was a big confidence boost for him, um, especially with his first two outings not going quite as well. Being able to come into an environment where it's Thirsty Thursday, all the crowds yeah. kind of yelling, having having a good time yelling at the guys and be able to go in there and just kind of shut them down. That's really good for him. Yeah, that was really good. Good to see also Kenneth Betancourt, who's been a great team player in this organization, was stuck in Rancho for a long, long, long time. Just kept grinding, got brought up to Rancho about a month or so ago. He had a couple of hits last night, and Alex Freeland has has, has, uh, hits in three games in a row, and he has hits in his last – uh, and it's six for his last 12, I should say. So Alex Freeland has been very hot as well. So the offense did just enough. The pitching was good. And so it was a good night for the Great Lakes Loon. So with that, any final thoughts, Austin? Yeah, overall, uh, really good. Uh, really good night. So you saw the Dodgers be able to win. That's obviously top of mind for everybody who's a Dodgers fan. Uh, and then there's a lot of good signs down on the farm. Uh, just continue to be patient. The team's are still enjoying themselves through the dog days of summer. Uh, They're still having good energy uh, and being able to produce as well. And I think there's overall just a really good feeling around this organization. Okay, so you're at the Great Lakes game, so uh, you got to see them, but I know you follow all the other teams and you watch all the action on your MILB.TV app. So, hey, Jake Reed got to pitch for Oklahoma City last night, but the headliner – was Gavin Stone. Okay, still the control and command is not exactly where he wants it or needs it to be. There's no way of getting around that. He needs to have better command. He needs to throw more strikes. He needs to walk fewer people. I believe that's eight walks in two game in his last two outings. He worked around the walks very well, the outing before this one. Not terrible last night as far as working around his walks. So let's get that out of the way. Needs to have better command. But five innings, there were a lot of positives last night for Gavin Stone. Five innings, five hits, three runs, three walks, eight strikeouts. The biggest positives, he reached 96 with his fastball, his four-seam fastball. He had a list of six-pitch mix, uh, six pitches. I don't always trust that because sometimes they get the cutters and the sliders wrong. So, But let's just say, hey, it was a big bag. As far as his pitch mix last night, he had eight strikeouts. That's very good. His changeup had a 43% whiff rate. His cutter and sinker had great movement. And his cutter, the smaller type slider pitch, whatever you want to call it, it also was a good strike pitch for him. And neither his cutter or his sinker got hit very hard. So, all in all, lots of positive. Not exactly where Gavin Stone needs to be to, to be that major league contributor at this moment with the type of of pitching you have going on at the major league level, but certainly a lot of positives. 
Yeah, a lot of positives continue to look for those signs with Gavin Stone. We saw all of the results last year. Now we have to look for some of those signs. Luckily for Gavin, he doesn't have to be that pitcher necessarily for the Dodgers this season. I think they have a little bit of depth. You got Ryan Pepio being able to come up at some point. Continue to look for those signs. Continue to find uh, some of find who you are, continue to work on some things uh, and continue to build towards next season. He's going to be port- important uh, for the Dodgers as they move forward. No doubt about it. I mentioned Jake Reed pitched last night. The thing about Jake Reed, the veteran, he doesn't throw all that hard about 91 on his sinker, but man, the movement on his pitch is 36 inches of vertical drop on a sinker. A 91, a 91 mile hour pitch with 36 inches of downward movement to it. It's a really good pitch. He had 41 inches of vertical movement on a slider, 28 inches on the cutter. So the movement, you know, hey, it's not always about velo. You know, velo is the big thing nowadays. But when you can combine 91 with with the type of movement Jake Reed was getting, that's a pretty good mix. That's that's a pretty good combination, I would say. Yeah, no, there's a reason that the Dodgers were able to – the reason why the Dodgers targeted him and picked him up is because of that movement. And sometimes being able to try to hit movement can be some of the toughest stuff that you can do as a hitter. And just continue to grind, continue to use kind of that stuff, be able to move the ball around, keep it in the zone, and get some of that weak contact I think is going to be important for Jake. Yep, no doubt about it. Okay, so last night, Jake Reed had a good night for Triple A Oklahoma City. Gavin Stone got the start. Pat Vileka, good athlete. I got a chance to see him. He had a good night last night. He had two hits and a couple of what I call ribeye stakes, a couple of RBIs, and a young man. I like to call him a young man, 36 years young. I believe he's 36. David Freitas had a chance to talk to him a couple of times, never put him on camera for interview but just kind of a little bit of chit chat you get quite a bit that of that with the great lakes loons this is a dude that has infectious positive energy i love watching david freitas play by the way okay he has a see what is 21 game hit streak how about that david freitas the veteran triple a catcher yeah, no, and he can provide some of that depth. He can provide some of that experience just to help some of these younger guys that are on that Oklahoma City team. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's surprising to see him just do that well. I don't, I don't think there has been a lot of attention drawn to that, but None. you got to celebrate these wins when you see them. Yeah, kind of a Crash Davis type scenario. You know, it's one of those deals where he's he's having a twenty one game hit streak and he's doing very well, and it just seems like. Nobody knows about it. Of course, he was on the develop list, development list. I have a hard time saying that every time I try to say it. For almost the entire season, he's been back a little bit over a month, and he has been very good. So, Triple A Oklahoma City, some good performances for them. Okay, so a guy that, that you are very, 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 very familiar with, Luis Diaz had two hits for Double A Tulsa last night, 15th double of the season. He has back-to-back two-hit games. The thing about Luis Diaz, it reminds me uh, of, you know, some of those hitters and some of the international hitters in the past. Vlad Guerrero comes to mind when, hey, just throw it south. He's going to swing at it, and he's usually going to hit it. Yeah, no, and – let me let me tell you about Luis. He yeah. can prov- he can provide energy. He can provide excitement, and he's one of the most athletic players that I've seen come through Great Lakes. Just his yes. ability to move around, his ability to field is incredibly underrated. He plays a phenomenal third base. He played first base too. I know uh, when back in Peoria, he made a really good game saving play over there being able to dive his ability to cause chaos on the bases i know he hasn't always been the most efficient base dealer but he can cause chaos on the bases when he's right there and he can be incredibly fun to watch offensively he has that ability to slug he has kind of that attitude uh when he's up there at the plate you can tell he's into each at bat he's into each pitch when he sees a good pitch and he kind of knew that it was coming he's like okay yeah Mm -hmm. oh yeah i can do this and he's kind of got that attitude about him and he was incredibly important to the gray lakes loon success early this season after that extremely slow start being able to watch him grow being and watch him adjust on the fly to that one of the most impressive scenes 
I've seen this season. And to see him continue to have that success in Tulsa, that's one of the most exciting things I've seen this season. Cody Hosey also had home run number nine. Cody Hosey had a very good June, had a very good July, hasn't had as good of a start to August. So hopefully he can get that turned around and then hey, have another good August too. So that would make three months in a row. That's a pretty long stretch of runway to say, hey, Cody Hosey's played good offense. That's been the, the side of the ball that has held him back. And, of course, obviously some injuries as well. The Quakes last night, Jesus Galise had a couple of hits. I love this young catcher. You're going to get to see him. And, you know, with all the catching prospects in the organization, people forget about this guy a lot because, uh, you know, they have so many prospects. You have Theron Lorenzo, Jorge Puerta, Simon Reed. They've had Dalton rushing. The Quakes have in the last 365 days. You have Yanner Fernandez. You know, you have Hunter Fiducia, who's had a great year. Will Smith, obviously, is still young. So, Jesus Galice, a lot of times, is a guy that doesn't get a lot of notoriety. But he has been on the Dodgers' top 30 prospects list. I'm going to be excited that when he gets up to you, of course, you've seen some great catching. Diego Cartaya, obviously, you had him. Last year, Carson Taylor, you had him as well. This year, you've had Yaner and, and Dalton. You know, So, Jesus Calise is a catcher that I'm very excited about out of Venezuela. Yeah, it's incredible the depth that the Dodgers have at the minor league level with their catchers. And they have guys that can play a lot of catching, too, to provide some rest for a lot of these guys. You have guys come in and out of the catcher spot. Just the incredible depth and knowledge that these catchers have. You just kind of expect them to be really, really good. And I'm glad to hear that they're continuing to have that success with a guy like a Jesus Galiz, who, as you mentioned, might go a little bit under the radar just because there's so much catching depth within yeah. this system. Yeah. Jesus lost his dad to COVID in 2020, and he was so super close to his dad. And he dedicates everything he does to the honor of his father. So super motivated young man, super wonderful young man. Had a chance to interview him on two different occasions. I love Jesus Calise. He works very, very, very hard. Super polite, super humble, obviously also super confident as well, which is the typical Dodgers attitude. So love Jesus Calise. Dylan Campbell also had a hit last night. That's his second game in a row, the, the recent 2023 drafty out of Texas. We talked about him where he can play anywhere from shortstop to outfield. I love Dylan Campbell, great athlete, great hit tool. Jared Karos, I know you've seen him pitch a couple of times with your own eyes. He's had one of those seasons that's been like this. It's been a roller coaster, right? So, hey, he's – He's either going to, you know, maybe get in trouble early in a game, or if he doesn't get in trouble early in the game, watch out because he's liable to go five innings and you're not going to get a hit off of him or very many hits off of him at all. So last night, five innings for Jared Caro scored us. He had four strikeouts, gave up just four hits. So a great outing for the UCLA alum. Kelvin Ramirez, he also came in and threw two innings. Uh, he gave up just one run. And then Garrett McDaniels, who just got recently called up to Rancho Cucamonga, he went one and two-thirds innings. He had two strikeouts and a walk. And then Ronaldo Yeen, I can't wait till you get to see Ronaldo Yeen with your own eyes. Austin, he came in as well. Ronaldo Yeen, the huge fastball. So all in all, on the night, the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes, they dropped three to two to move their record to 58 and 53 on the season. So, hey, before we get out of here, okay, taking up a lot of your time. This has been a good show today, Austin. Final thoughts. Yeah, overall, good, a lot of good action, a lot of good environment throughout the minor league system. Obviously, I got firsthand knowledge being able to see loons pull through, but there's still a lot of excitement throughout the system. Uh, we are coming into the final stretches past next couple of weeks. It's going to be some of the last final weeks that you have of minor league baseball. Take advantage of it. Be able to go and watch some of these games. Uh, if you are in the area, try to go to one of these games. See some of these guys. I know it does mean a lot to them to be able to support them, to be able to go cheer on your uh, favorite minor league team through in the Dodgers system. Uh, and, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of good action, a lot of good environment. We're getting to see some good looks from a lot of these guys. And it's, there's a lot of good stuff. 
Okay, thanks, Austin. Another great job. You've added so much to Dodgers Daily. You mentioned that on our Dodgers Dog Show, so I greatly appreciate you. Another reminder, fans, hey, the next time that you'll see us will be both Austin and I on Monday morning, so look out for that show, our next Dodgers Daily Show. A reminder, hey, we are now open for business for corporate sponsors. If you know anybody that has a business that would like to sponsor our Dodgers Daily Show, our Dodgers Dog Show, anything on DodgersDaily.net, the social media platforms, just DM me or you can email me at DodgersDaily73. That's DodgersDaily73 at gmail.com. Also, don't forget to leave a like, leave a comment, interact with this video, make sure your notifications are turned on. So as always, I'd like to thank you for tuning in and say go Dodgers.